Hi everyone, welcome to another Office Hours. It's hard to believe that it's August already. It feels like we were just kicking off our January Office Hours session just a few uh, weeks ago. I'm Apoorva from the Rebus community. You might have seen me happening in the back of um, many of our Office Hours sessions over the past few years. Um, today we are gathered um, with a great lineup of guests to talk about licenses and how to have a conversation around this concept with students. As always, our um, office hour sessions are co-organized with the Open Education Network, and I have Barb here from the Open Education Network who's going to co-host with me today. Unfortunately, um, Karen Lauritsen, who you normally see co-hosting from the Open Education side, um, is feeling a little unwell and not able to join us today. But we have fantastic representatives in her stead. Um, before diving into um, our session for the day, um, I just want to hand it over to my colleague Zoe, who has a small announcement to share. So Zoe, over to you. Thanks, Aparva. Hi, everyone. It's lovely to see you all, as always. Um, I do have a little news to share. Uh, sadly, I am no longer going to be hosting these sessions um, that we run every month. Uh, we've had some internal changes happening at Rebus, and we have new funding coming in for, for a project that I also manage, so I'm going to be shifting focus onto that, um, which means that if you see me here in future, it'll be just kind of lurking in the background listening in, uh, but I'll no longer be taking on the hosting duties, but am passing that baton over to the very deserving approver who has been a real powerhouse behind these sessions anyway. So it's exciting to, to kind of see uh, where she's going to take it in that role and continue on working with the Open Education Network, which has been a fantastic partnership for us. Um, I do want to say thank you to everybody who shows up to these. It's been such a, a wonderful part of the, the last few years of work that I've done with Rebus community. Um, and certainly I'm still going to be around and contactable and all those things. Um, I realized as I was reflecting on this, I have been doing this almost since the beginning. So that's going on three years-ish, maybe even a little more. And I still forget to introduce myself almost every session because it feels like I'm just stepping into a conversation with friends. So thank you all for, for being a part of that um, and for everything you bring to, to these sessions. They're, they are what they are um, very much because of you all who both present and I know a lot of you here have, have been, um, been speakers on these before and also your participation in the discussion and the conversations that carry on elsewhere. So I'm very grateful to all of you all. I will miss being a part of these um, very much, but I, I really look forward to seeing them continue on. So thank you. And with that, I'll hand back to Bob to introduce our speakers for the day. Thank you, Zoe. We really appreciate all you've done to build up office hours and we are certainly gonna miss you. So best of luck in your new role. Um, so as they've mentioned, my name is Barb Thies and I am the community manager stepping in for Karen Lauritsen today from the Open Education Network, formerly the Open Textbook Network. And as Aperva mentioned, today's office hours topic is talking to students about open licenses. Our panelists will share their experience designing and assigning open pedagogy projects with students and specifically how they've approached questions around licensing. We are lucky to be joined today by three presenters, Lindsay Gum, the scholarly communications librarian and assistant professor at Rogers Williams University in Rhode Island. Amanda Larson, the affordable learning instructional consultant at the Ohio State University and James G.G., the Dean of Educational Technology, Learning Resources and Distance Learning at the College of the Canyons. So with that, James, I will turn it over to you. James, Rick. before you jump in, I yeah. will just flag, um, for anyone who might be attending office hours for the first time, um, I just want to note that a format, as Zoe's described, is very informal. It's a conversation, it's a discussion amongst colleagues. Um, all of our speakers will take about five minutes to just share their experiences and perspectives with um, the topic. And then we'll turn it over to you. So the remaining time that we have, um, we'll welcome questions um, either in the chat or you can always unmute and um, ask your question out loud um, and turn it over to you to drive the conversation. So that's how we'll go. And with that, James, I'll let you take the stage. <laughs> Thank you, Pervin. Thank you, Barbara. I'm really, uh, thank you for that reminder because I'm a first time guest and a first time participant and, and I'm really thrilled uh, to have been invited to participate because uh, the office hours, it, it's something that I've always wanted to make time for. I, I admire the work of Rebus and admire the work of Open Education Network so much and, and, and admire the individuals who, who are involved. So I'm really happy to be here. Um, just as, as a little bit of context uh, to my remarks, uh, 
Uh, my role at my institution is as a dean or an evil administrator. I, I count beans, I push papers, you know, I write grants and other people do the work. That's sort of my, my role at the institution is to, 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 to work in the, you know, in the bureaucratic guts of the institution. So, uh, so that will give a little bit of shape to, 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 the, to, to my further remarks. And then also my institution is a teaching institution. We're a community college out in California. And yes, it is smoky and there are fires everywhere, but you know, that's, that's life in California, I guess. Um, uh, so, so I'll, I'll identify sort of initially three and a half ways in which I've uh, interfaced with students around open licensing. One, I think many of us would, would relate to as an initial touch point, and that is speaking with student organizations or students on the quad uh, uh, about open textbooks, right? OER, hey, sign up for a class that's, that has OER. That's what this is. So that, that's an initial conversation. And I think many of us would agree, oh yeah, free textbooks, yay, that's a pretty easy conversation, right? Um, and then from there, uh, my primary point of interaction um, has been with, with, with students has been in employing them. One of the reasons that we have a pretty well-developed uh, OER initiative at my institution have have probably 25% to 30% of our sections utilizing open textbooks in, in lieu of commercial textbooks is that uh, we've uh, employed student workers to help to work alongside our faculty in adopting, adapting, and authoring open education artifacts. Uh, so that uh, the, the, my, my primary point of contact with students has been student workers who are coming in, they've got a job, hooray, they're working on this, this free textbook thing that's easy to process, but then quickly you have to really help to educate them and help them learn uh, what, what the licenses are in a pretty sophisticated way because they in turn are interfacing with faculty and trying to have conversations with faculty. So you wanna make sure that they're set up to do that successfully. Um, I, I will observe that I find over time uh, there's been a, a, a lot more, I, I've observed a greater familiarity with the concept of open licensing as more and more students are familiar with the concept of sort of free range creation and being creators and, you know, following YouTubers and following gamers and, and, and creating, you know, printing t-shirts on their own, you know, this kind of create creative realm is, is uh, I think, helping people to, to understand a lot more about openness. Um, and then a, a third way in which I've, I've worked alongside students is on a, an, out, an outside project uh, that was funded, funded by the Michelson 20 Million Minds Foundation, and that is to help uh, support a, a network of students across California to create an OER student advocacy toolkit that would, that helps to explain to students who want to be advocates on their own campus around, again, free textbooks is the catch. How do you do that? How do you do that in a, perhaps a more advanced way? How do you write letters to trustees? How do you approach faculty and so on? So uh, that's been a, 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 the third point of, of uh, sort of explanation or, or interface with students. And then the, the half way that I mentioned, the th three and a half ways is a conversation that I've started to have on my campus and that I hope that we are all starting to have or maybe others are already doing this and that's around the general idea of informed consent uh, and I think uh, open licensing really gets us uh, to in a certain way gets us to the question of informed consent which is incredibly important when we also talk about access codes we talk about um, uh, digital digital tools that students are forced to purchase and forced to subject themselves to and the data mining that's going on there and the complete lack of awareness and lack of concern on the part of faculty and institutions about exposing students to these dangers so i, I think there's a larger conversation around informed consent that, that, that licensing also fits into and, and with that I'll, I'll kick it back to, to purva and, and we'll move on thank you so much james lots to dig into there so i'll um, let the attendees know if you have any questions for James, please feel free to start dropping them into the chat. Um, but for now, we'll turn it over to Lindsay and hear from her. Great, and, and thanks, James. I love to hear 
a perspective from a dean because I, I never get that. Um, it's really interesting to see. How, no, no, really. Um, I'm such, I'm in my own little librarian bubble. So it is really refreshing to see how um, that might help me talk to administrators about how they might talk to students too. Um, so hello, my name is Lindsay Gum. I am a librarian at Roger Williams University, which is in Rhode Island. Um, and so I work fairly closely with students in the classroom um, as a support. So I collaborate with faculty who are engaged in, in open pedagogy projects, um, even if they don't know that they are. Um, <laughs> so I really focus on supporting students um, by means of balance, balancing the risks, rewards, and responsibilities of open licensing their own intellectual property. Um, so I often start by just um, engaging them in discussions about their rights and responsibilities. So when we're talking about them as consumers and contributors, um, we need to help them understand their rights, not only as authors, so um, helping them contextualize their own intellectual property. So helping them understand that what they create actually is their own. Um, it's under United States law is copyrighted um, instantly. So having those discussions with them, um, but then also having them understand the responsibility, um, helping them ensure that they're using others intellectual property responsibly. So that means both eth ethically and legally. Um, and that if they are creating content with the intent of openly licensing it, that you know, certain things have to go into that so that they're doing you know, sound research, evidence-based information. Um, they're using content, if it's third-party content, that they're making fair use assessments if they're not getting um, permission from the author directly. Um, and I work with two, kind of major sets of students on campus. So um, uh, Dr. Heather Maselli, who's actually on the call today. So she works with general ed education students. So um, she does an open pedagogy project where I work pretty in depth with her students on the content that they're creating. But I also work with um, architecture students. And so there's, um, with those students, we actually dive into um, section 120 under United States code, um, which is, a specific um, phrase that depicts basically like ar architectural copyright law. Um, and so we have discussions about as students, what they're creating, um, you know, they own that intellectual property, but once they enter the profession, how that changes. Um, so if they're working for a firm, how do they um, take ownership over their rights when they're contracting? Um, so those are always really interesting discussions. Um, I touch a lot on agency and privacy. Um, and something I want to focus more on this semester is the concept of information privilege. So helping students kind of develop an awareness of what that is and how they can use their own openly licensed contributions to start to break down those systemic barriers, um, which can also help them start to develop that responsibility toward the broader community. Um, so I do a lot of that work with faculty when I'm advocating for them to publish in open access journals, but I think this is a really good opportunity for us to have the exact same conversations really with students um, on that level, because so many of our students um, that I work with, they've been in this educational system since they were young and they've always had access to information through school libraries, university libraries, and once they leave that system, um, that access initially um, or essentially disappears. And so helping them understand that that will be them someday, um, they will encounter paywalls. And so helping them understand what open access is, what OER is, what, what it means to openly license your own intellectual property and help others and help the broader um, community. So um, yeah, I'm happy to answer more questions um, and I'm going to put something in the chat. Um, so this semester when we shifted to online, um, Heather and I, um, we had to figure out pretty quickly how we were going to continue on. Um, so we came up with a, a pretty cool lesson plan that essentially delivered what I normally would in person um, and engage students in those same conversations. So I'm going to post that lesson plan into the chat.
and I am all done. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lindsay. Excited to see that lesson plan. And James, um, we'd love to see that advocacy toolkit that you created with your students as well. Yep. So if you with that, that would be fantastic. Um, Lindsay, it's nice to hear you note that a lot of these conversations are similar to ones that you have with faculty. So um, they're just similar conversations that we can think about um, and they're not necessarily entirely new dialogues that we're having with our students. Um, so I'm excited to dig more into that and dig more into that idea of information privilege and how students can help break that barrier starting out their own college journeys. All right, Amanda, I'll let you round us off with your perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Amanda Larson um, and I have worked with students in multiple capacities. Um, largely my work focuses on working directly with faculty and so a lot of times students are just the ultimate benefit benefactors, not benefactors, benefiters of um, the end result of that. Um, but one area in which I've worked really specifically with students is in partnering with student government. And um, those conversations can um, vary. It depends on sort of what they're interested in as an organization um, and how primed that they come already for the, having that conversation. So how much research have they already done about open educational resources and affordable content and what are their sort of end goals? So what are they trying to achieve? Um, in an ideal situation, I would start with the intellectual property policy at the institution that I was at um, and talk them through how they own their copyright and um, cases, and then like the case scenarios where that isn't true. So are they working? Is it like a work for hire kind of situation? Because they don't necessarily understand that nuance and honestly, neither do faculty and people who are staff working at universities. Um, and so walking them through that, but like in the classroom, they own their copyright. And so what does that mean for them? Um, and also I try to provide really concrete examples. So when I do talk to them about work for hire, I talk about like you're in this specific situation where you are creating something as part of your job. And so typically that resides with the university. And I find that that really helps make sense of that to them. But what I like to talk to them about is they're thinking about their affordability campaigns. Um, so at Penn State, they were really interested in getting sort of like a course marking put into Lion Path, which is the registration kind of system, or um, here at um, Ohio State, they were really interested in originally getting course reserves started, and they partnered on the library to do that. And then sort of like the relationship has dissipated. And now that I'm here in this dedicated role, we're working on building that relationship up. But the new uh, president and vice president ran on an affordability platform. So we sat down and had a meeting to talk about what does that look like for them? What are they really interested in doing? And they want to be able to make like a Yelp system where they can put little like have little dollar signs next to courses to say how expensive the course materials are so that students can make more informed decisions when they are thinking about signing up and registering for those courses. Um, in working with student government, I have been really lucky that they've come really well primed with knowledge about open educational resources. They've read a, a lot of the literature already. And um, that really, not having to do that initial instruction around open licensing has led to really interesting ways of collaborating. So uh, for example, we had at Penn State, we had student government representatives who sat on our OER university-wide working group. And so we were able to call, ask them if they would like to present with us at like a all day faculty um, professional development day on open educational resources. And the student we worked with was very well educated on the subject and was able to talk about the research that he had read and was able to answer even like those old crumbly professors who were like, oh yeah, our quality is terrible. Cause there's always one of those. And, um, and they were able to demonstrate this facility with that information and speak really eloquently on the topic and change that person's mind, which is always nice to say because students are our best advocates sometimes. Um, the other context in which I have worked with students is around open publishing projects. Um, and this started back when I was a teaching assistant at the University of Wisconsin 
and um, we worked with a course to create an open um, collection of object stories for a historical society. And the students were working to help create the material, so they all had to write an object story about something in the collection, and so they had to do research on it. And what I learned from that experience is that scaffolding is really important. You can't just throw students into sort of the weeds of doing this work like it's a regular assignment. They need to learn beforehand about the publishing platform that you're using, the licensing that they're being required to pick, um, and there needs to be also support, like really concrete examples of what they're trying to accomplish. There need to be very well-defined roles for what they're doing. And um, so I will not rant for five minutes on scaffolding, but I could just know that. Um, but out of that course came a lot of questions around, do they have to pick a license? If they own their copyright, do they have to work openly? Um, and then what if they change their mind later? What does that mean in, choosing a license now? What can they do about that? Particularly if maybe they're not presenting work that they're necessarily proud of at the end of the semester. Uh, we hope that's not the case, but it could be. And also, um, if it isn't their best work, what does that license, like choosing that license, what does it mean down the road when, say, they're applying for jobs or they want to point to work that they've done and maybe somebody Googles them and that comes up. Like, how do you have conversations around having worked in the open around those topics? Um, and also, um, also around privacy. So maybe they're in a situation where they don't necessarily have the freedom to work openly. And uh, those are sort of the things that I've carried through in thinking about like, how will I do this again in the future? And there will be lots of scaffolding and we'll have conversations around their privacy and as James said, informed consent. So what are they consenting to participate in when they take the course? And I think if we can really lead with that information up front and build a very nice scaffold experience, things will all work out very well. Um, and that project did finish, even though it was very haphazard. And there is a finished product of a thing that was used at the Historical Society. And then from that experience, the person who stepped into my role after that, Naomi Salmon, helped build really scaffolded experiences for the next time that they did that kind of thing. So it was a learning experience. And I think that it's sh really shaped the way that I think about working with students in the future. And now I'm done. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, there's a lot to think about. And I know you talked about how um, that publishing project with the object story was sort of a learning experience. But if you wanted to link out to it, we'd be more than happy to see the work that students have done. Um, now is the time for us to turn to all of you for questions. Um, so while I let all of you start gathering your thoughts um, for our wonderful guests, um, I might actually invite Heather Maselli, who Lindsay mentioned, to share um, their perspective as a faculty member working with students um, on open pedagogy projects. Heather, yeah, would you I'm, like to Oh, yep. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm happy to share my perspective. So obviously, Lindsay, um, Lindsay comes into the classroom um, for my open pedagogy project, um, which is, this is the fifth semester um, that we've been working on this project. Um, my students, they're general education science students, and I have them create content-based websites um, that basically serve as the textbook for the next semester students. Um, I, I've had problems in the past with readings being too uh, content heavy, too um, you know, too high level um, in the science content area. So I was like, well, what if non-majors wrote the textbooks? And so they have been working on that for four years and I'll throw the link to the project in the um, chat when I'm done here. Um, but um, when I talk about open licenses with them, obviously Lindsay takes the, um, the hard work. Um, she comes in and really sets the stage, but obviously I have to be there to support them. Um, the biggest discussion I had with my first group of students was what was our collective open license going to be. Um, the first group of students was actually very concerned that textbook companies were going to come in and steal their work. Um, and so they opted to choose that uh, non-commercial license. Um, but with that open license, 
on the websites, we can then, you know, it sets up the project so that we can make it renewable so that the next semester, another student group will come in and start editing the website and add more content to them. So now five semesters in, we actually have some pretty robust websites on space exploration, climate change, DNA, um, all sorts of different science slash society topics um, that can that do a really good job of sharing um, science content in a way that's um, accessible to students that are not scientists. And so, um, but that open license is really key to the heart of the project. And Lindsay is a rock star when she comes and talks about uh, open licenses with them. I've learned so much from working on this, so. That's my perspective. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, that sounds like a fabulous project. And I really like that idea of um, asking students to focus on the renewable aspect of um, the assignment. It's not just sort of a one and done. And I know for a lot of initial conversations around um, Creative Commons licenses, around open pedagogy, um, people tend to begin that conversation with copyright. But I like your idea about building to preserve and it sort of goes back to that idea of information privilege that Lindsay was talking about um, licensing and being able to share your work down the road um, is also about giving back to the community it's about building a shared responsibility amongst us and that might be a nice way um, to start that conversation rather than copyright and intellectual property which are also important but uh, not maybe as relatable for students um, while I wait for some um, questions to come in from the community. Um, I was wondering, uh, we've talked about scaffolding, James talked about um, training student workers. Um, I'm wondering, are there specific resources that you typically send out to students to say, before we jump in, I want you to read this primer on uh, whether it's the Creative Commons licenses or something else. Um, are there a set of standard resources that you typically would point your students to? Well, we've 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 it, certainly it, we've begun using the uh, uh, I, ca I can't recall the specific title, but the uh, how to create an open textbook resource from Rebus, of course. Uh, uh, and, and in the past, we would sit people down and have them watch uh, tens of hours of CCC OER webinars, you know, uh, dedicated to to open licensing and, and, and creating op open education initiatives. Um, and then certainly the the Creative Commons website is is terrific, and and uh, um, you know the the different kind of uh, uh, Wikipedia articles about you know open licensing and and, and OER are, are very useful. Um, so so no, we don't have a, a standard other than say you know here are you know the the primary resources in the field uh, dig in. Um, but I I'm envious of of the. Uh, sort of intellectual structure that both Amanda and Lindsay <laughs> reveal in their work, um, and and I, I certainly have approached the conversations with with students around licensing from a very uh, pragmatic viewpoint, probably a very self-centered and self-serving viewpoint of that that I want to get a task done. You know, um, certainly the, the the task that I want to use the students to achieve is is going to benefit more students, but I really admire the uh, again the, the structure. Uh, that, that I sense around educating students in, in just research literacy or information literacy in general and uh, rights, roles, and responsibilities that Lindsay referred to. I think that's, uh, those are really admirable and, uh, and I could use, a, use a, a, you know, a real step up to, to get, get my game up to, to their level. Thanks, James. Lindsay, go ahead. I see you. Yeah, I, I can jump in there too. Um, so I, in the lesson plan that I posted, I, I posted the wrong link at first, but the second one is the, the lesson plan that we used um, in the spring. So not, it's not normally what I use in the classroom. Um, I normally have a lot of those conversations face to face, but I had to figure out a way to kind of, to prime them um, for some assignments. But um, yeah, I don't necessarily assign a lot before we um, dive in, but I do, I do 
after like the workshop. So we have like an intense like IP creative commons workshop um, where we also talk about privacy and stuff like that. And I do give them a handout with like refresher key takeaways um, where they can find more information. So I'll try to find that. I know I have it somewhere to share. Um, I know Heather assigns a, an article, which I think is linked in my lesson plan about um, online bullying and trolling and what that means for your privacy and whether or not you may want to use a pseudonym um, or anonymous, something like that. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't typically like have them watch videos in class and say, okay, we're going to watch this little segment, but that's just happened, happened to be how I had to do it this past spring. Um, and we also held um, copyright office hours on Thursday mornings for those students um, because we were remote. And so if groups had questions, um, they could pop in. Usually it was just Heather and I having coffee together for an hour, but um, I think we had one session where someone came in. <laughs> Can I ask or something else I, I think I take from Amanda and Lindsay's uh, comments is that they have a specific sort of sanctioned role within their institutions to educate students and support faculty around the topic of intellectual property, copyright, and then licensing comes into that. Uh, that's a distinct difference from, from my setting at my institution and from the community colleges with which I'm familiar. Um, in the community colleges with which I, I'm familiar, uh, it's the, the situation is typically that you have a, you know, an advocate, a, a champion, an OER champion, and maybe they are, it's spreading over time and you've got a couple of departments that are on board, and maybe you've got a dean or director who's, who's a champion, but to a large extent, they're sort of off in the corner uh, doing their thing. They're, they're not necessarily part of the IP or research literacy uh, undertakings at the institution. Uh, hopefully you have good relations with your librarians and a lot of times in community colleges, librarians increasingly are involved in that kind of work. But uh, also because community colleges are so understaffed with librarians, uh, it's, I, I, I'm hard pressed to think of a community college librarian, uh, a community college library that has a librarian on staff who's a, who's has advanced knowledge in copyright or IP. So I think that's that's a distinct difference that I'm hearing and something I again I I, I envy about their roles. Yeah, I, well, let me respond to that a little bit. Um, and I have found that while I'm sanctioned to talk about these things, um, uh, at both of the institutions I've worked at now, there are people in copyright roles who I need to partner with to make sure that we're using the right shared language when we talk about that. So there is that consideration. And sometimes that language can come all the way down from the general counsel's office. So that was interesting to have to learn that starting from like this mild curiosity I had in grad school where I took an IP course to suddenly like, oh, I'm emailing with lawyers from you know the, JC, the GC office and um, so that that was interesting to sort of figure out. And I think also you're working sort of from like that specific work for hire. So they don't really like they don't really need to know about their intellectual property because yeah. you're hiring them to do a thing and you've already selected the license and way in which they'll do it. So those other skills are more useful learning about like the information and research literacy parts in order to be able to create the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are two slightly different projects, um, but it's it. Thanks, James, for point, pointing out those two different perspectives, sort of as a dean versus um, someone in an educator position, whose um, part of whose responsibilities include um, talking to students and informing them about um, their various options and the impact of particular um, licensing conditions. Um, there are a few questions coming in from the chat, so I just want to take a moment to turn to them. Um, yeah, I just answered one from Jonathan. It was a good question. I think I understood your question. Why didn't I put um, CC licenses on what I shared? Is that what you're asking, Jonathan? Yeah, so um, so it was interesting. Um, so Heather is actually the one who found the HyperDoc template and she started using it um, when we went remote and she said, hey, look at this cool template. And I said, oh, that would be really great for me to use. It had a, a copyright HyperDoc at the bottom and 
So we tried reaching out to them to see whether or not um, we, you know, could put an open license on it. We never heard back from them. Um, but to my recollection, they were educators and they kept saying, please use this, share. We want people to use this template. It's great. And we don't necessarily think they understood what putting a copyright symbol at the bottom of that document would do to people who understand what that means. Um, so that's why I didn't. Um, I'm sharing it here, but um, I didn't feel comfortable putting an open license on it. And for the, the Google Slides, the students didn't necessarily know that I would be sharing um, this with other folks. So, yeah. So we'll just check the permissions on the slides and hopefully you'll hear back from the hope, uh, folks at HyperDocs and yeah. be shedding permissions. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Lesson plan. Thanks, Jonathan. That was a good catch and good question. Um, Zoe also asks um, in the chat uh, whether you found things that often create confusion or students with students as they begin to engage with this work. Um, if you've identified any of these things, how have you resolved them? And over your years of engaging with students, have you seen any patterns form? This could be answered by any of you, so feel free to jump in. I can. I'll, I'll, I'll start Go off ahead, with James. you. Oh, sorry. So, nope. so in the work, the, the work that our folks are doing, uh, I think they're pretty common kinds of questions. And that is, if you've got a, 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 a something that's licensed CC BY, how does that mix with something that's CC BY? SA, CC by NC, SA, you know, how, how do you resolve those questions? What takes primacy? And if you're, if you're creating a compilation that ultimately will be CC by, how do you treat something that is, you know, SA within that? You know, th those kinds of questions that I think many of us have dealt with, um, I resolve them by reaching out to somebody at Creative Commons or for reading the listservs and, 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 and trying to educate myself. Um, the, the other, um, pattern that I uh, wish I would see that I have not seen or has not gotten back to me at least is students interrogating their instructors about licensing and, and, and their own intellectual property rights. Uh, again, I'm envious of, of, of Lindsay and Amanda's comments about uh, uh, raising student awareness around their own intellectual property. I wish that were the case uh, at my institution. It's not yet. I can say that some patterns I've seen over the years working um, with Heather's students particularly are um, confusion between citations and attributions. Um, mm -hmm. So the content that they're creating for these websites, you know, I work with them on using the library's databases to find research, um, which they then use to create the copy for their um, websites. So helping them properly cite that, but then when we're including um, you know, like third party content they find on line, um, like images or media, how do we properly attribute that? So helping them understand the difference between citations and attributions comes up probably every semester. And I try to, I try to, um, I think it was Amy Hopers, she has a really good, or Quill West, one of, one of those two rock stars has a really good um, presentation on the difference between those two. So I've taken, um, content from those presentations to include in my own workshop with, for students. So instead of letting them get to the question eventually, I just put it right there in the beginning. Like, there's a lot of confusion between these two things. Let's talk about it. Um, and the other thing is um, we do encourage our students to use third party content. Um, so helping them understand what fair use or fair, fair dealing, if you're in Canada, is. Um, and to really help them understand how to make those justifications. Um, and usually that's done on a case by case basis with me um, or with Heather. Um, so those are probably the two things that stick out the most to me. Thanks, Lindsay. I think it can be especially helpful to look at third party content to get a sense of what those conditions and permissions mean. And I know James mentioned in um, his initial um, five minutes that looking at the three range of content that we see from creators, whether it's a gamer or someone on YouTube, can actually help students make more sense of what that particular condition means, what that particular license means, how they can reuse it within their own work, or how a 
licensing their own work similarly um, would help and disseminate. Um, Amanda, I just wanted to go to you and see if you had uh, a response to Zoe's question. Any yeah, um, that have come up? One of the things that I have noticed that they get really confused about is that it's so much coming at them so quickly. So they're like trying to learn a publishing platform or a, a tool. And then on top of that, they also have this licensing component and a research component that they need to. And so um, having to really clearly define those into like three separate activities would be how I would address that. Um, but it can be very confusing to be like, okay, so here is where you did the licensing in Pressbook and this is where you'll put your statement and that's, this is what that statement looks like when they don't really understand yet what that means for licensing. And um, yeah, this could easily just turn into me ranting about scaffolding again. So folks, just scaffold things, just scaffold things. Um, and then the other thing that I have noticed when talking with student governments is um, they're really interested in sort of doing these really, really big and hopefully impactful projects, but they aren't necessarily sure about the steps to get there. And so I tried to talk to them about how understanding the licenses will allow them to work more openly and transparently, particularly if they're interested in like continuing the government trick forward into their future. Um, and so there's a lot of confusion around how those things intersect. And so I like to talk them through that. I think that's a useful exercise, a student or faculty. Again, we're seeing a lot of the similarities between conversations that we have with our students and faculty. Um, thank you for that. We have um, about 15 or so minutes left. So I wanted to just turn to the audience and say, if you have any more questions, please feel free to drop them into the chat or unmute and ask away. Um, something that, uh, Lindsay, you mentioned during your five minutes that I was really curious about um, was you noted that when you're working with faculty on open pedagogy projects, sometimes these instructors don't often recognize that what they've actually assigned for their classroom is an open pedagogy project, might need to involve a conversation with their students about licenses. Could you give a few examples of what yeah. these types of assignments might be and how, how can someone recognize whether what they're actually doing is open pedagogy work? Sure. So I think my, the best example of that is um, Heather and I's colleague Bob in architecture. He's he's fantastic, and he's so interested in in learning new things. And um, so he he called me one day and was like, "Yeah, I want to do this thing with my students, and I want them to like share all of their stuff. And do you think it would be helpful if you came to the classroom?" And I was like, "Yeah, like that would." Yeah, I, I should probably do that because he has no idea, like it never occurred to him to talk to his students about, um, you know, like agency over their intellectual property and what does it mean when you're sharing your content. Um, so he was really interested in doing this work. And when I explained to him, I was like, well, there's actually like a name for this. Um, <laughs> he, he was kind of like surprised um, and he still has a very, um, I'd say non-traditional definition of open pedagogy. Um, he doesn't necessarily encourage his students to share outside of the classroom or the architecture program, but he's really interested in having them share within the School of Architecture um, and to kind of carry their work with them in this digital portfolio, he calls it, but he does require that students share it with each other. So, and they are taking third-party content. They are um, putting their own content out, out there. So um, yeah, it's it's been a really neat um, relationship because I'm not a liaison to the School of Architecture. We have an architecture librarian, but I am actually the person now that goes over there to talk to students about copyright and IP and all that. So um, for me, I have conversations with faculty and it's these relationships just kind of like organically happen and Thankfully, it's to the benefit of the students um, because I think a lot of faculty are doing things like this um, and their students may not be getting the scaffolded support that they really need, like Amanda was talking about.
Thanks, Lindsay. And Amanda, I saw you nodding when I was asking the question earlier. So it looked like you might also have um, experienced some examples of faculty coming to you and describing an assignment and you said, hold up, um, I think we need to have a conversation with our students about this. Uh, is that something you've also encountered? Yes, that is absolutely something I've also encountered. And a lot of times they don't make the connection because they aren't necessarily using OER. So maybe they're using library license content so that it's still affordable and it's still solution. It works within sort of the spectrum of affordability at the institutions that I work in, but they don't that but because their uh, their original text isn't OER, they don't see the connect like the explicit connections to the work the students are doing to being open pedagogy. And so that's actually been something I've been thinking a lot about is when you're working sort of in this affordability spectrum, how can we still be encouraging instructors to work sort of like with open pedagogy. And so there's been a lot of times where it's been like, well, this assignment, you're like, you're having your students go find stuff and they're building a thing. And this is their intellectual property. Are you talking to them all about like how they want to share that and um, and it provides a lot of opportunities to also talk about like open peer review um, and why just sharing it openly in general might be great for their course and um, and then sort of building on that conversation to sort of like take them down the road to the next steps. But yes, definitely I've had that conversation where, hey, there's your, this thing you're doing and that's actually a thing that people do called open pedagogy or open educational practices and can we talk about that more and how can we scaffold that for your students so that they're having a better experience doing it. Yeah, I'm, I'm composing an email or an announcement in my head to faculty saying, you know, are you doing this? We should, we should talk. Uh, that is fantastic. Uh, let, let me know if you have a, if you have a template email or announcement. <laughs> yeah, no, Joyce, I was going to reach out to you and ask you from sort of the administrative perspective, do you sure. think that there's something that could be uh, more codified into how departments tend to work that would encourage at least that faculty begin by reaching out to their librarians if they have them, educators like um, Lindsay and Amanda, if they have access to them. Is that something that's yeah. a little more formalized than it is right now? Well, I'd say yes, absolutely. And I, and I think there's a great place in, in teaching focused institutions for uh, work around open pedagogy. And as, as was mentioned, there might not people might not necessarily refer to it as open pedagogy you know we might talk about uh service learning community-based learning project-based learning uh co-creation uh and, and so on and so forth uh, all kinds of different ways in which uh, faculty and students are working together without ever having considered it open pedagogy but uh uh i think at many institutions we have teaching and learning centers or uh you know uh, instructional support centers which would be a, a logical uh, logical place to uh, center those kinds of initiatives in a lot of uh, community colleges. Uh, the distance education or online education team by default becomes the creative hub on campus. Uh, so those would be areas in which uh, I think the that, that kind of conversation should take place or could take place. Um, and and I, I think again uh, we come back to maybe a difference between you know research focused institutions and teaching focused institutions uh, our, our resources, our institutional resources around uh, publication and around uh, research just are different than they are at, at research-focused institutions. So it's not necessarily something that people are otherwise thinking of. You know, uh, certainly when I, when I speak to faculty about uh, attribution versus citation, it's a, it's a huge uh, light bulb moment for most of my faculty colleagues because they haven't they haven't encountered or thought about anything like that since graduate school which may have been a long time ago um, you know there's there's still a lot of our colleagues are still teaching you know the APA format that they learned in graduate school so um, so, so yes yeah, there I think that's uh, working with working with faculty who engage students in creation is is a great way to start the conversation around open but more than that create the oh, oh start the conversation around informed consent intellectual property and arm students uh, or, or outfit students with better information literacy better research literacy and skills and knowledge that can transfer with them into the workplace as well James, I think another um, 
maybe into that conversation with faculty might be to pull up your institution's IP policy. Um, so for example, like ours clearly spells out like faculty own their, you know, instructional materials, scholarly output, whatever, but it also typically includes students and at most institutions, students own their IP. So you could kind of make that connection like, hey, you know, you own your IP, but guess what? Mm -hmm. So do your students. And so what does that mean yeah. when you're asking them to do, um, to create things and to share things, right? They have the same rights as the faculty member would essentially. That, that's a wonderful tip. Yeah, I, I, I hope ours does include students. And I hope everybody's does include students, but that's a way. And if it doesn't, we could revise it that way, work with student government, another, another opportunity to work with student government. And then also that opens the conversation uh, if, if it is in fact the case that institutionally uh, students own their their content, that also opens the conversation around uh, uh, plagiarism detection tools like Turnitin.com and uh, surveillance and the extraction of student student data through access codes and all kinds of other platforms that uh, that faculty all too often force students to use. Thanks, James and Lindsay. Um, yes, what intrigued me about this conversation right now was thinking about sort of future uses of these resources, um, how it impacts students' um, professional advancement um, as they're thinking about skills that they might pick up for their careers. I know one of the questions that um, Amanda mentioned that she often hears from students is, what does this license that I choose right now mean for me down the road? What if someone looks, uh, looks me up and um, finds a set of publications associated with my name because my IP was attached to this uh, piece of content that I, was, uh, that I created? Um, so these are all, I think, really important things for us to think about because a conversation around licensing isn't just a one and done. There are so many different points of intersection, whether it's about IP, copyright, whether it's about attribution of that final resource, or thinking about skills developed and its eventual use down the road. So I just want to say thank you all for um, getting us to think about all of the different points of intersection um, and the seemingly straightforward topic. Um, we are coming near the end of our um, session right now. So I just wanted to turn back to our three guests and maybe ask if you had any final perspectives that you wanted to share with our attendees. Um, are there any suggestions um, for any of uh, our participants who might be uh, engaging uh, with their students on an open pedagogy project? Is there something that you would immediately recommend that they do? Well, I would, I, I would say, first of all, do it. Uh, become the person on your campus that your campus needs. Um, educate yourself. Uh, if you're in an institution that doesn't have, have a, a, a librarian who's, who specializes in intellectual property and copyright, become that person for your campus uh, and, and uh, uh, reach out to student government, reach out to, to other people on your campus, probably the, the teaching learning center or, or your online education folks, again, who, who oftentimes are the people who are thinking a little bit outside the box uh, and find allies there. Yeah, I would echo that. Um, and typically, there's usually someone in the library that can help with these kind of um, topics. So I would say, you know, definitely reach out and try to identify that person on your campus, where, wherever it might be in a, a center for teaching and learning, um, the library. Um, but identify support um, would be really helpful. And then just to keep an open dialogue with your students to, you know, always, you know, stop and check in with them, um, have them share their concerns um, or their excitement about what it might mean to openly license their content. Um, and I think there's lots of opportunities to um, kind of contextualize the benefits of open in today's society. Um, you know, recently with COVID, um, you know, content that's in open access journals and what does that mean for us as a society moving forward? Like if, if medical researchers can instantly access this new research, like how does that help advance society um, and public health? So just, you know, making those connections within your own discipline can be really um, empowering for students to see how they might contribute to that in the future. 
And I think my final thought is, is that you are, if you are already doing this work to support instructors at your institution, then you probably already have the materials you need to talk to students about it. You just need to adapt your own materials to a different audience. Don't try to recreate the wheel just because you're talking to students. Yes. <laughs> I love that thought, Amanda. Yeah, that, that's a great suggestion. All three of them have been fantastic. So thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for such a rich conversation. I'm just going to turn it over to Barb um, from the Open Education Network to chime in. Great. Thank you, Aperva, for facilitating. And thank you, Lindsay, Amanda, and James again for joining us today. Um, I just want to remind you all that the recording of today's session will be found on the Rebus community website. And the topics for these conversations are driven by the OEN and the Rebus communities. Um, so I'm going to drop a link in the chat here. If anybody has a topic that you're interested in us highlighting for future office hours, please do feel free to submit that and we will certainly um, consider your input. Um, Zoe, I just want to say thank you once again for everything you've done for office hours. And um, I hope you all have a great beginning of the school year. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lindsay, Amanda, James, um, for your expertise and everybody else for attending. I uh, we'll look Thanks. forward to seeing you next month at September office hours. Thanks for hosting this. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Bye.